Well, I think we can start, because as usual, I see you here numerous and happy and warm. Good to see you all. Tonight, it's going to be from the podium, a little different from the usual setup, but I'm super happy to see you all here for this quite great event about synthetic aesthetics, new frontiers in design and in biology, should I add. And it's amazing to think that um, six years have gone by since Design and the Elastic Mind, which was the exhibition that allowed me to meet so many of the designers and the scientists that we're going to talk about today, and uh, that introduced me to this topic, really. And also, my co-curator, honorary co-curator Adam Bly is here. Adam, so it's great because uh, six, seven years ago, we were having meetings of this kind to put together designers and scientists and let them talk and see if a new way of designing without the membrane and the interface of technology could happen. If designers could uh, don a lab coat, as Michelle Fisher uh, explained to me before, the possibility of designers to wear a lab coat and of instead scientists to just get rid of one, you know, this kind of exchange of clothing that makes today's uh, fer fertile turf so promising for the future. So um, this is quite exciting because we've been talking, especially Daisy Ginsburg and Michelle Fisher and I, we've been talking about this meeting for quite a long time, ever since the book Synthetic Aesthetics was published, which was a little bit last year. And in putting together this presentation, which is Michelle Fisher, as I was saying before, that put it together. She's the uh, curatorial assistant in A&D that worked with us. We tried to look for a few flashpoints in the history of uh, synthetic biology. And we tried to look a little bit at the, um, the events leading up to where we are today. Since I have very little time, I'm not going to read the slide. But you can see that truly everything is about understanding our DNA, being able to read our code, being able to dive deep into the code of human beings and of things so as to be able to recombine it and to, and to create new entities or to uh, change entities that already exist. And the uh, synthetic biology and synthetic aesthetics is a vision of biology transformed into a medium and material for design. These are the words of Daisy Ginsberg, and that's where we are tonight. We're thinking of how designers and artists can collaborate with biologists and with synthetic biologists so that the result is so much more than the sum of its parts. When you look at the flashpoints of synthetic biology, you get to see a few more events that, uh, that happen. You know, like iGEM, we decided to have the meeting here today because it's just a few days before iGEM, which is the, uh, the annual gathering at MIT where students and designers and scientists from all over the world come together to talk about genetically engineered machines. And so many people from outside of the country are on this coast to go to iGEM. iGEM has proven to be a pretty important meeting and a spark for so many of these collaborations collaborations, as have been the first international meeting on synthetic biology that happened in 2004, and all of the different schools that have embraced from the University of Edinburgh to the school in uh, Australia and Perth, where Symbiotica teaches, to, of course, the Royal College of Art Design Interactions, that have embraced this particular new field of research. And of course, you see here the synthetic aesthetic book that was, uh, that was written and the research was initiated by Jen Calvert and Alastair Elphick that are here tonight, together with Drew Endy, now at Stanford, synthetic biologist, the dad of the biobricks, as we like to call him, and Daisy Ginsburg, the goddess of a synthetic biology and design. <laughs> <laughs> so um, these are some of the little flashpoints. But to give you an overview of where synthetic biology is today in the real world, you know, we can talk about very different fields. For instance, one of the first fields is medicine, the idea that uh, we can coat both prostheses and implants in the body so that they are less susceptible to rejection, and the idea that we can tweak and change many different parts for bio-inspired coating for medical devices, of course, but also um, devices implanted in the body. So medicine is definitely one of the biggest areas of experimentation. 
and where uh, synthetic biology is already quite a reality. The environment also, you know, you probably have all looked at uh, the fact that you've already read about the fact that it is estimated that as a global population, we're using the equivalent resource of 1.5 planets. I mean, we're overdoing it. So whatever we can do to curb our, uh, our um, exploitation of resources is really meaningful. And we have, on the one hand, the reality of synthetic biology ap uh, applied to biofuels in order to recycle, reuse, and also uh, dispose of fuels better, and instead the design fiction that is here shown in the work of Daisy Ginsburg. She has this great project designing for the sixth extinction. I'm also quite obsessed with the sixth extinction, so she's really thinking of synthetic biology applied to a form of design that produces species that are actually helpful to the replenishment of the planet as opposed to the devoid of the planet. The third area of application, interestingly, is also mass market and commerce. And there are some technologies that are really applied also to detergents, for instance, um, that are uh, making detergents that are much more biodegradable and that are healthier for the environment. That's already an application that's happening, and then there's many others that are under development. Not to mention symbio food. I want to, if you can please go down a little bit with the volume, I want to show you here here, on the one hand, reality and fiction. The fiction is quite beautiful, volume down a little bit more, uh, quite beautiful in the work of Min Soo Kim, who is a student from the Royal College of Art in London. The idea that you can have symbio food that keeps on acting and giving you new sensations as it goes down the drain, right? So the idea that we can have a completely different relationship with food, so a relationship that some Asian cultures already know about, you know, those who eat the squid when it's still alive and the octopi when they're still like attaching themselves to the uh, sides of our throat, but it's a completely different experience and relationship that we could foresee for the future. On the other hand, we have the examples like the symbio vanilla, vanilla that is a threat to so many um, uh, to so many people in Madagascar, for instance, so many people that depend on vanilla as, um, as a, an export all over the world. And of course, we have miracle rice that has been uh, an element of contention for so many years, and that even though genetically modifi modified to really add to the nutrition of so many cultures all over the world is still not distributed because of the stigma of genetic modification. Another area of application that is also rife for the imagination of so many designers and writers is terror and bio, bio warfare. Um, you know, it's really, of course, a possibility. And in this case, Andrew Hessel, together with Mark, Mark Goodman and Stephen Kotler, Andrew Hessel is a really great um, scientist that works with Autodesk at Autodesk, um, had this whole scenario built with the fact that uh, by taking you know, blankets or by taking cups with the DNA of the President of the United States, anything could happen because through synthetic biology, uh, all sorts of both decoy and also maybe even clones could be generated. And it's really beautiful to see this fictional statement here. Personalized bioweapons are a subtler and less catastrophic threat than accidental plagues or WMDs, yet they will likely be unleashed much more readily. So the idea that we can start from within in the destruction of, uh, uh, of biological entities as opposed to from the outside has generated many uh, ideas and many dystopian ideas as well. And when Andrew Hessel was actually able to create this virus for Autodesk, these, these ideas became a little more reality. This is the synthetic Phi X174 bacteriophage, um, a virus that infects the E. coli bacteria, but is totally benign for humans. So it's already happening. It's a 3D printed virus of sorts. It's possible to have a synthetic production of synthetic biolog biological entities. It's already a reality. Of course, this creates all sorts of ethical conundra, not conundrums, conundra. Um, and we've seen President Obama addressing this when the first, um, when it first happened that in 2010, Craig Venter announced that he had created with his company the world's first 
self-replicating synthetic genome in a bacteria cell of a different species. Um, the, uh, the panel here that you see here for the ethics of synthetic biology was put together very quickly. And when Craig Venter had made the announcement in May, they, were, they, they got at work immediately and they published this report in December. So the idea is that if you can create life and a life of a different kind, the ethical implications need to be explored deeply, as you can imagine. Where we are today with synthetic biology is at the idea of creating catalogs, of creating almost alphabets of DNA bricks. You know, we've been talking about the BioBricks Foundation, which is now based at Stanford University and that was, amongst others, founded by Drew Endy. And then we also have a registry of standard biological parts. And it's interesting because um, uh, Michelle Fisher was saying we should go back to thinking of the Werkbund of the Association of Architects and Designers in Germany at the beginning of the the 20th century that was thinking of the consequences of standardization for human species. At that time, they were thinking of the standardization of dwellings and the standardization of uh, areas of town. Think about the standardization of synthetic biology parts. It's really interesting uh, how it can open a whole new scenario of parity, disparity, and universal customization. So the implications are huge, and they could be explored in many different ways. One way in which scientists and biologists and designers have been trying to think about it is by opening up not only the discourse, but also the manufacture of these new entities to the public. And there are more and more of these labs, of these like public lab, that are available and open all over the world. And tonight we'll have Dan Grushkin here talking, and he's one of the co-founder of GenSpace, that is our own lab here in Brooklyn. So there are more and more of this kind of literacy that is, that is spread to the public. And what I think is really also interesting for us to explore tonight is the role of designers. This was an interview that Drew Andy gave in 2014, so very recently, and you see here, to view synthetic biology as merely being the domain of scientists and engineers is a mistake of the first order. You don't have to be a scientist or engineer. We're all synthetic biology together. That is rousing. But the truth is that the relationship with, between scientists and designers, and we'll hear a lot about that from Daisy tonight, has become prolific and very beneficial to both sides, even though it sometimes uh, pales a little bit when it's uh, uh, subjected to the scientific peer scrutiny. But we're trying to change also that, or at least they are trying to change all that. MoMA and synthetic biology. Well, it's moving to think of 2008, of designing the elastic mind, and of how um, that introduced us to this new field of design. And afterwards, William Myers, who used to work here at MoMA in the retail department, believe it or not, went on to produce this great book, Biodesign, Nature, Science, and Creativity, and he now works in Amsterdam and Next Nature. And these are some of the works that we, uh, that we collected in the collection of MoMA. Um, you see here some completely mm, complete scenarios, you know, critical design scenarios, and speculative like Michael Burton, Anotopia and the Race, in which Michael tries to conjecture what will happen if biology could really be applied and what would be the consequences in the difference and disparity amongst classes. Or James King, who uh, was thinking about what a stake of the future could look like when it can be grown in vitro. Or uh, Susanna Soares here to the right, who was thinking that we should be equipped as human beings with sensors that enable us to capture DNA information and genetic traces from other humans so that we can get to know them better. You know, a little bit like dogs sniffing one another, but a capture that is more, more capillary. Or Elio Cacavale that was looking for a way to teach children what happens when you mix the DNA of a goat with the DNA of a spider, thus obtaining a milk that has the protein of this really strong thread of silk. So it really is um, this new field that we wanted to document with some of these, uh, of these acquisitions into the collection. But for more MoMA anecdotes, the funnier one, the funniest one was the, the victimless leather by Symbiotica that was in Design and the Elastic Mind, which was growing too fast. You know, it was like this little coat made of mice 
stem cells that was built on a scaffold of proteins and then nourished in an incubator. And we didn't really tell MoMA that this thing was alive. And actually, according to our own cats and Yonatsuri, it was semi-living, so it was not really alive. But when it started growing out of control, we had to stop it, you know, somehow, which meant we had to cut the nourishment. And that threw not only us, but also the world at large into all these sorts of ethical questions because I couldn't bear to turn it off because I thought I was killing it. And uh, uh, I didn't know what to do, so I did what one does when one is in a very deep moral dilemma, one talks to the press. And uh, <laughs> so a blog appeared in The Economist, and the day after we had evangelical Christians calling the Department of Architecture and Design of MoMA and threatening us because we were killing a stem cell, a my stem cell coat. So it was really quite interesting, but this whole evolution just goes to tell you that we can feel this ethical dilemma on our, on our skin. Um, similarly, you know, the whole dilemma about in vitro meat, whether we should eat meat at all, whether it's okay to eat meat if it's grown in vitro. And Andras, are you here? Andras, yeah, Andras is here. So Modern Meadows CEO and founder Andras Forgac is here. And uh, um, I tasted his in vitro meat chips. And uh, that's one of the applications that could happen in the future. And it's a whole discussion. That's why uh, it's not only fiction. These, these novelties, these big revolutions, they're not novelties, are really here. Um, more understanding of the evolution between reality and fiction can be found, for instance, in the work of Agatha Haynes and Stellark. You know, Stellark is the quite well-known artist that transplanted a year in his, uh, in his arm, and it's already been like two or three surgical operations for that to happen. And the work of Agatha Haynes, who, th who thinks that she can grow certain cells of animals and uh, re-engineer them biologically so that they will not be rejected by our body and then can provide different organs. And instead, on the bottom, you see scientific work that's actually happening and is uh, a, a path to that particular future, but is already in the works. Viz Institute is doing these organs on chips. They're like modeling of human organs for testing of certain medication without going through human trials. Or you see he, here the bionic ear by Princeton University, which is an attempt to replicate the chemistry and the physics of a year in vitro. So you see, there's a lot. And of course, in the middle of it all are the ichromi that Daisy is going to talk about later on and was her collaboration with James King and possibly one of the first really uh, successful collaborations between designers and scientists at iGEM. Uh, and that was five years ago. She's going to tell us about it later. Other real uh, possibilities, the biopixels that the University of San Diego is developing using E. coli that change colors and become bioluminescent in certain conditions, thus providing a new way of uh, providing electricity and lighting. And the fictions, you know, mushrooms are the kings of this particular new uh, field of exploration, as we'll learn from David Benjamin afterwards. This is a fiction, of course, but it's the idea that one could grow these beautiful mushroom balconies in Mumbai that would provide a way to clean buildings and also give fuel and nourishment to the inhabitants of the buildings. Other fictions are Arne Hendricks, The Incredible Shrinking Man. You know, the idea is that we should be about 40% the size that we are today if we, well, I was telling you before, we're consuming 1.5 planets a year, so we should accordingly shrink in order to consume in proportion and not deprive the Earth and not go towards entropy. So this whole design fiction field that Daisy will explore later has provided a lot of fuel for thought to scientists. And of course, you might have heard about Stuart Brand and his wife, Ryan Phil, and Stuart Brand, he of the Good Earth Catalog, is now into the idea of de-extinction, the idea that biologically we could clone long-lost mammals and animals, and even not long-lost, like you know the pigeon, the famous passenger pigeon that used to be the most common bird in the United States at the beginning of the 20th century and is now completely extinct. So the idea of replenishing and refueling the earth, even though it sometimes goes into science fiction, 
is always present, as is the idea of creating whole new species. This is an exhibition that I think is still open at the Science Museum in London. It's fantastic. It's this uh, uh, photographer, Joao de Fontcuberta, that, uh, well, he does also other series, like there's an Orthodox priest that like surfs on the waves, but all these miracles that could happen in nature and beyond nature. And of course, he has created a whole wonderful bestiary. And I Hasegawa instead at the Royal College of Art thinks that us human beings could decide to gestate endangered species instead of populating the earth with yet more humans that are going to screw it up completely. Um, one of the uh, other um, projects that has fascinated so many of us is Heather Dewey Hagborg's Stranger Visions. She picked up butts of cigarettes in the streets of Dublin and reconstructed the faces, it's part fiction by, based on some science, the faces of the people that were smoking these cigarettes. So it's really interesting to think that one could rebuild a whole human being from a cigarette butt. Um, and it was part of the exhibition Grow Your Own that was curated, you know, Daisy Ginsberg was the main curator, but there were several others. And it was at my beloved uh, science gallery in Dublin that always does the best design and science shows, uh, teaching people how we can grow all sorts of materials and things on our own, including human cheese. This is the work of Christina Gapakis and Cicel Tolas. Usually people go, ugh, you've seen it before? No, but it's, it's cheese that is made hum using bacteria from our armpits. Mushrooms, I was, yeah, exactly. I was waiting for some kind of reaction. I was telling you about mushroom. Mushroom mycelium has become um, really one of the most interesting uh, elements to be studied by designers, architects, and scientists. It's a little bit like the gecko, the, the, the myth of the gecko in biomimicry, you know, studying those particular, or the lotus leaf. It's become the paradigm for um, the application of biology in making and manufacturing. And you see here just a few examples and I particularly like also this example, Maurizio Montalti from the Eindhoven Academy that decided to use mushrooms and the mycelium to biodegrade corpses, this kind of magical, beautiful way to like, you know what I mean. <laughs> and of course we see here the gorgeous um, installation that David Benjamin and the Living did this summer at MoMA PS1. It was great and uh, it really showed the possibilities in a way that couldn't uh, happen better because people could see and could touch with their hands and could even smell. There were a lot of people trying to smell uh, the structure, this living structure made of bio bricks that were held together by mushroom mycelium using the technology of the Ecovative, ecovative, I always don't know, I always not know where to put the accent, which is uh, two um, engineers from Troy, um, New York, from Rensselaer Institute that developed this particular way while they were looking for a new packaging material that could substitute for polyurethane foam. So mushroom is one of the biggest champions, as are silkworms. The work of Neri Oxman and the Mediated Matter Lab at MIT at the MIT Media Lab is just amazing. And in this particular case, it's the idea of incorporating biological manufacturing into manufacturing by using silkworms as 3D printers or as construction workers, however you wanna use the metaphor. The idea that we could really think either by applying external algorithms or by tweaking the DNA of animals that we could incorporate their, incorporate nature in the way we build is one of the ways to combat, to, to fight entropy, to actually find a way to replenish what we have taken away. And uh, I really like also this post-natural history. There's many examples of this kind, but this idea of engineered insects that enable us to do better. And I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna end with this manifesto by Michelangelo Pistoletto, The Third Paradise. It's a beautiful and symbolic project that talks about the fact that the first paradise was the one in which humans were fully integrated into nature. The second is the artificial para paradise developed by humans through a process that has now reached globalizing proportion. And 
the third paradise is the one that comes afterwards when we will be able to give back to nature what we have taken away. It's a symbolic gesture, but it's one that I think we're all working towards. And definitely the people that are here tonight, tonight are working towards. There are many questions that we will ask tonight, and you've already found some in the email that we sent you, and I'm sure that you have your own. But we're really going to try to discuss the position of designers in the world of science and the position of scientists in the world of design. And we have four great people to talk about all this. I'm going to start from top left, and I'm going to proceed, and they're in order of appearance. The first will be David Benjamin, architect and scientist and artist, now teaching at Columbia University, co-founder of The Living, that is a company that explores new manufacturing methodologies and also the idea of open source architecture. I'm not going to say much more, but his work is just incredibly important for the field of uh, biology, design, and architecture because it's all about things in the making, and it's about finding new ways to connect the way we build to the way nature has always built. Second comes William Shi, one of the co-founding professors of the Wies Institute at Harvard. The Wies Institute is an extremely interesting place where so such advanced research happens, but it, it happens with always an eye towards design and towards also the kind of research that is more speculative, but then can find solid roots in the in science. And William has been working in many different fields in synthetic biology, and he specialized in DNA origami, which is a way to fold DNA to create new structures. You'll see it when he will show them to you. Daisy, well, what can I say about Daisy? I mean, we go back a long time, five years, but uh, she's quite stunning. She is an architect that has trained in many different parts in the world. I met her when she was at the Royal College of Art in the Design Interactions program that you might have understood is one of the main centers for this kind of research, very close to Imperial College, so it has all these scientists that are there for the taking. And, uh, uh, and she has also become really, um, I don't want to diminish but cheerleading in a good sense. Like she's been able to gather the scientists and the designers from all over the world that want to participate in this research and to connect them in a network that goes from Australia to Stanford all the way to Edinburgh. And last but not least is Dan Grushkin, who is a great writer, writes about science in many different blogs, but also in like serious and authoritative uh, magazines and newspapers. And also he's one of the co-founders of GenSpace, which is a place where people go, people, kids, adults, and uh, young adults and old adults go to learn about synthetic biology and about biology and about making. Without further ado, I would like to invite to the podium David Benjamin. <laughs> 